Okay, <laughs> it's working. All right, so we're going to talk about Mandelbrot's business today, right? So we've had uh, Simon's model, very nice, random growth, highly plausible kind of thing. Well, you know, it's a simple mechanism, you can see where it goes wrong, but uh, it's a basic story that gives rise to a whole family of parallel size distributions, which we see everywhere, it's a big deal, so, you know, the statistics of surprise business. <coughs> Let me concentrate on what I'm saying. So. Uh, we have, uh, I'll, I'll show you something completely different to start with. Um, some of you might know, we, one, of the, one of the things we do in the computational story lab is measure uh, happiness from text, right? So, and we have about 10% of all tweets ever made sitting here at UVM, uh, which was just a, kind of an accident of us writing to them in about 2008, saying this looks interesting, there were four of them working there, and they said, sure, here's a little feed. So we still have it. And uh, now it's just an enormous number of tweets that comes in every day. So we've been doing this thing uh, where, let me maybe bring up another page to start with. Right, so we have all sorts of stuff. We have, this is, this is a big time series for, um, for Twitter in English. So you can see this kind of, this is, a, this is the average happiness uh, on a daily basis. You can zoom in and do all sorts <coughs> of things. You can see, uh, these kind of these jumps on annual holidays, right? So that's kind of when, when people express lots of positive things. There are also some negative things on those days. You know, it's not all terrific. Uh, but so these Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, so people are saying all these things. Valentine's Day is positive as well. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Independence Day for the US pops up. It is just all, all tweets in English from around the world, so which is still dominantly the US, so that's the flavoring there. The bad things that happen are unexpected. So here's the Boston bombing, uh, for example, terrible thing. The not guilty verdict for George Zimmerman, that was here, so that, that ended up being a very negative thing. Corey Monteith's death. Uh, and we've just had Ferguson, is this <coughs> dip here? And before that, Robin Williams. So the, and then the Malaysia Airlines flight. Uh, this is Germany beating Brazil 7-1. That was <laughs> kind of registered as a negative event. Uh, we do have Portuguese, actually. So we have 10 languages. We, we, we do have Portuguese. So we'll, we'll put that up at some point. Uh, you, and you can play around with this, right? So you can zoom all around. There's, uh, it does all sorts of fun things. Uh, there's the whole, let me get that to work. There's the whole time series going back to 2009. Now, of course, the demographics have changed, right? But there's sort of this overall trend of things getting worse for a while and then maybe starting to kind of climb out again. Uh, but certainly this is early on in Twitter's history and so the, the user base has changed. Now that kind of little up and down that you see the whole way is actually the weekly cycle, right? So Tuesday on average is the lowest day of the week. Not Monday, Monday gets a bad rap. Monday's pretty bad but it's really Tuesday because you're not, there's nothing that you've forgotten the weekend, you can't talk about it anymore and there's just days and days before you get to Friday. And Friday's okay, now you're liberated. Saturday's great. You know, and Saturday's full of things like wedding and party and movie and, you know, those words bubble up to the top. And I'm not really showing, I'm not going to show that, well, maybe I'll show a little bit, but we have this word shift thing that, that t gives you a texture of why you know, one text is happier than another. So, of course, Twitter's fun to play around with, so we've worked on that. It's quite useful. We have maps, right? So here's, where's Vermont? Vermont is two for the last 30 days for geotag tweets coming out of all of the states. It uh, ranks it in, in second. Uh, this is relative to the, they all ordered relative to the uh, average for the whole of the US. And it turns out that this ranking by you know, Twitter, which is insane by what people are just saying on Twitter, you know, a few bots in there, of course, all sorts of things going on, uh, correlates very well with the Gallup Wellbeing Index, which is a survey based thing. So this is a real time uh, measurement of, of how things are going. Louisiana, Mississippi, often towards the bottom. Um, a lot of these things. The one of our studies, uh, Louisiana, uh, which one? Uh, Lieutenant Governor was quite upset with uh, <laughs> with us. <laughs> and uh, there's another there's another study that has uh, Louisiana, you know, just at the top, and that was uh, the one they took. Anyway, so. <coughs> 
but a lot of, anyway, so we have this uh, you know, completely different thing where we've stuffed in all these books from the Gutenberg Project, which some of you may know about. It's an effort to put uh, all books that are out of copyright online. And it's been around for quite a while. Uh, so that's 75 years, I think is copyright roughly. So there are a lot of uh, uh, old time books. There's some pretty weird ones, 10,000 books, right? So there's all sorts of stuff in here. Um, we have a few classics. So you, there's just a few classics listed here. So you can play around with these if you want, right? So Tale of Two Cities. Uh, we have um, Crime and Punishment, both of course in Russian and then tr a translation to English. Um, there's uh, Metamorphosis, which is good. But it's, very, it's a bit too small. Count of Monte Cristo is one of these books that actually ends really well, and you can see that in its, in its pattern. So this is Frankenstein. It uh, ends badly. Um, <coughs> science proves that it goes wrong. And this, these things are a bit complicated, but basically this little region here, you can take a region that you want to compare the text here to any other part of it, and it makes a calculation that shows you, you know, why is this region less happy according to our measure than this other one, and it's because these words are being used more, these, these negative words here, miserable and enemy and despair and death and dead and rage and die and die. so these are bad words. Um, you know, and words are tricky, right, because, you know, there's context, and especially with English, context matters tremendously, but murder is hard to, you know, like happy murder, you can't really do it. So, so you see the texture of it, if you look through it, you know, it's horrible down here. Um, these, you can see it, you can say, oh, okay, it's bad. There are a couple of words that are going the other way. So happiness is being used more in this section than it is here, and it adds up in such a way. And there are a couple of negative words that are being used less, like poverty and grief and so on. So these things are going against the trend, but the dominant story is this way, and then these little sums here tell you. So it's negative words being used more is, is why the whole thing is being pushed down. Uh, so there are some happy words that are being used less, some, and these are the guys going against the trend. These are a little complicated to look at, but it's the right diagnostic. Anyway, so I was going to show you one we just added, which is Harry Potter. Okay, so you can, do, you can actually shred books. If you own them, you're allowed to do this. Of course, the text isn't there. We've broken it down to a thousand word blocks and then just smushed it into a, into a vector. So you can't pull out Harry Potter. <coughs> but the copyright people get upset. Um, but we're going to actually stretch this one out and annotate it and so on. And, and of course, you can make all these comparisons. So that's Dumbledore's death right there. I mean, we need to see where Cedric Diggory is. I don't think he gets the, the bump down. See how sad they are. But there's, so you can look at them individually. Prisoner of Azkaban is interesting. So this is about the only one, I think, that ends well, right? So lots of trouble, and then it's all good towards the end. And again, you can make these kinds of comparisons. So if you like Strava, we've used a little bit of a Strava um, structure here, uh, right? So we'll compare the end bit to this, this little dip. And over here, you can say, well, there are these bad words are being used less. So you can look at those. We have lots of fun things. All these bad words are being used less. That's what they were being used in here. So kill and killed and bleeding and pain. And then these other, <laughs> right? And then like and smiling, good, chocolate, happy. All these things. Chocolate, right? The dark chocolate to, for, the, for the dark magic business. Isn't that the story? <laughs> Obviously sponsored by Hershey's or something. Or Mars, it's English. <laughs> Very sneaky. So, uh, you know, all these positive words are in here. There's a whole extra thing. This actually works very much like a physical <coughs> instrument. There's a lens structure to it, and you can change that around. Um, it's kind of incredible to me, but this is all built on JavaScript, which is now one of the fastest uh, kind of languages around because it's just been you know, improved and improved and improved. It's, it's, it's not a beautiful thing, but it's sitting under so much. So anyway, so you can see, you can, you, know, you can get the texture of why these things go like this. So of course, we have, uh, we have to have Moby Dick, which no one's read, but... Um, it's a great one to study, full of great words. Yeah, so it ends badly. The whale wins. That's a good summary of uh, Moby Dick. It's like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> missing, so if you do look in the book, it's missing, you know, boats are missing, people are missing, it is, yeah, yeah. So die, poor, shot, lonely, shooting, cowards, fatal. It's bad, it's bad. Anyway, you know that if you read it, but this is an interesting kind of texture thing. So. Uh, yeah, you have to be careful with languages because die, you know, if you've got German popping in there, it's all over the place, right? And you're thinking, why are the Germans so upset? But they're not. Right. So you have to be... Anyway, the inspiration behind all of this is um, none of these things. It's... Uh, you could look at this later on. There's a, there's a link to it. But it's Kurt Vonnegut talking about shapes of stories. It's quite, quite amusing. All on a blackboard. Very funny. Uh, that's linked to at the bottom of these things here. Yeah. Anyway, so these things are tremendous to play around with. And we will put in chapters and all that sort of stuff at some point. That's harder. 
But the, okay, so here's a, I lost it, did I? Uh, let me go back to, it takes a while, it takes a while to load the whole thing. Because it's a bit of a beast. It go, all goes in the browser and it gets calculated. Uh, come on, yeah. So I did, I, this is Dumbledore, and we don't have the divisions, but I don't know, can you, Harry Potter fans, people who hate Harry Potter out there, what do you think that one is? So this is the percentage of the way through. What's that? Sirius Black, yeah. Sirius meaning dog, right? All these little trees. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think, maybe so, yeah. <coughs> I've had to read all of these out, and I'm into my second go, so. <coughs> Dumbledore, it's, it's hard, Dumbledore, the Dumbledore monologues kill, you, kill your voice. Anyway, so, yeah, that could be Sirius Black. Yeah, no one cares about Diggory. Also, of course, the books are very uneven, right? There's like the little books to start with, and then. Well, like, them right, right, it goes. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, just do whatever you want at that point, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So what's the just like after the Yeah, so I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if we can find it maybe in... It can't be the Half-Blood Prince, right? Yeah, that is. Is that it? Yeah. Does it look like the same thing? All right, we'll see if we can figure out what that is. So this is just a... So you kind of have to compare it to something else. So bad things are going to be down here. So death. Death is a <laughs> becomes a big word. Um, maybe do this. So golden snitch will be in there, right? So one of the things we will get to is phrases eventually. So you can see where this breaks down. Um, yeah, who gets Oh, one of the Weasleys? Oh, I see. All right. Yeah, so there you go. And then there's sort of, we're just going to hit you all the way back, all the way through. <laughs> it's starting to feel good. And <laughs> yeah. Soap opera style. Just playing with your emotions. <laughs> and, you know, just feeding you plot devices the whole time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Harry Potter and the plot devices. It's pretty, it's pretty rough to read it again. It's like, okay, that happened, all right? <laughs> yeah. Genres? Yeah, we haven't put them together yet in that way. We've done that with music lyrics, so we've compared genres. So um, we have to put it through this because we've got a much better instrument now. We have, so if you, if you sort out, um, actually just by the titles of songs, you know, and you have, I don't know, we had 50, what did we have? <sighs> Must be more than that. We had 50 or 60 years of music, of song titles and all these genres. And so, and they're actually pretty stable in terms of emotional content. So gospel and soul is at the top, and heavy metal's down the bottom, <laughs> <laughs> and rock and pop are kind of up here. Westerns are you know, sort of in the middle. Um, rap is here, and punk is down here. And it's really, yeah, metal and industrial is right down the bottom. You know, some of that Norwegian stuff, whoa. <laughs> and, and it does a good job of sorting out uh, the, the band. So if you just take their collective works, you know, you get um, Buddy Holly near the top, and... S Club 7, you get all these kind of boppy, like, and a real range, right? They're from every era. Uh, and at the bottom, it's Slayer and Misfit and Metallica. I think Metallica was the only one I recognized, but they're all, you know, they're all, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very clear. Death Knot, that's down there. Um, so bad, bad things. So it really does a good job of sorting those things out. And in some ways, that was one of our first tests to sort of show that it was working pretty well. So I think one of the things there is that it's stable, it's pretty stable as you go across time. And that in some ways, so, you know, these, these new genres, are, they're taking up some new part of music space, but also sometimes new emotional niches. And, and, and you know, it takes a while for us. It was all happy before, and then <laughs> metal, metal appeared and really filled a, a void <laughs> with more void. <laughs> Uh, we'd have to look, I, we do have them sorted out like that, I'd have to look them up for you, but um, the thing is too, we, need, we, we will make a showcase of it on this, in this thing, and it will, it will use this much better instrument. So in a sense we've used a lot more words, evaluated a lot more words. The thing about this one, I guess it's disappeared, but we'll, 
you know, Harry Potter is sufficiently interesting enough that we could put the whole thing out and make a, you know, annotate it. You know, Dumbledore gets it. Stuff like that. <coughs> we'll do it the right way. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, right. So this, this guy has, I need to start talking. Um, if you go to, you know, this is a bad thing, right? So here's, it pops up, it gives you the word shift. This is why this day was a bad day. We have it set up so that there's a link to a Wikipedia page. So there are major events indicated all along. So, of course, you know, these are bad words. But you see prayers, for example, going the other way, right? So there are these offsets to it. Um, and in general, say Saturdays are positive events, as I said, but you'll also see bored and hangover, you know, these kind of words that are <laughs> negative going against the grain. You'll see lonely sometimes on, you know, Valentine's Day or Christmas Eve, which isn't good, but, um, yeah, so these things pop up and you can, you know, everyone's eating, they're all happy. Uh, it's pretty, it's kind of cool. You can move from day to day like this. You can just and not even look at what's going on. It's just fun to do. Um, so there's lots of things. You can tweet it all. Anyway, all right. So that's some fun. But we just got the Harry Potter thing to work, so that was fun. Uh, yeah, it's, it's weird because we've actually improved this by getting more words and so on, and it's, in, it's <coughs> like making a better lens for a microscope. It actually got better. You know, it wasn't clear. It could have changed all the results we had before, but it actually just showed things with more resolution. Very much like a physical instrument. Um, okay, fun times. Actually, there's still more fun times because it's the course content. <laughs> and let's talk about that. Okay. Anyway, you can totally, you can play around with those things. Any configuration you make, right, so you sort of make some reference and some comparison, you can either tweet it or just copy the URL. It has that, it's all built into the URL, so you can say, you know, instead of saying to someone, go to the site, click on this book, you know, compare these things, you can show them the comparison. All right, so we're going to go to uh, this Mandelbrot business. And it's all about, yeah, optimality. All right, that's his argument. So that's what this is, this little scr um, scribble is trying to depict. Right, we have some system, and of course we thought about words and cities, uh, and <coughs> um, what else have we thought about? Oh, elephants, right. So, you know, which is totally silly, right? So we have... Uh, this idea of them maybe being not so well organized to start with, that the cities are sort of distributed in some weird way. Uh, and, you know, and this is a funny kind of lineup here, but they, uh, through some optimization process, maybe a little unspecified, but, you know, we'll have an argument that suggests that things will tend towards some optimal state where we end up with a parallel size distribution. Right? And the the very much the, the framing for this is language. So uh, the the degree to which you could argue that it applies to other these other areas like city sizes and number of especially say number of um, species per, per genus. That's that's not really clear that that, that might work here. But it, it's about language. Uh, so let's just kind of focus in on that for a while and see how we go. So we have Mandelbrot, Benoit Mandelbrot, very famous character. He passed away a few years ago. Um, I guess, you know, during the time I've been giving this course, so, you know, at some point I had to sort of say he's not with us anymore. Um, uh, bit of a cantankerous fellow, you know, pretty kind of strong-minded character. <coughs> and uh, he came up with this framing of fractals. Other people had sort of produced things like this. Richardson, the fellow I told you about, who did a little work with uh, weather and then uh, distributions of uh, war sizes, um, terrorist attacks and so on, inspired by his work. Uh, he, uh, he had a, a paper on the, what's the coastline of, what's the, how, how long is the coastline of England? Right. And pointed out that it depends how big your little rule measuring stick is. And it would scale with your measuring stick size. So that's, uh, so, so Mandelbrot uh, really did, did some, you know, kind of cleaned this up, made it kind of great, and uh, gave it a name, fractals. All right, so he's famous for that, but he did lots of other things. And so this is back in 1953. Is that right? So it's actually a couple of years before Simon's uh, paper, and it appears in a book. It's a it's a chapter in a book. So let's see. It's it's a it's a well crafted thing. Okay. So it's going to be optimization. <coughs> the idea is language is efficient. So it takes it takes Zip's idea that you know that there must be some balance in the uh, uh, you know you don't want the sp the speaker to have a huge burden when they have to be very 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 extremely precise and label everything. You need to put some burden on the, on the receiving end. All right. And somehow there's going to be a, a balance. So if you can use words more than, you know, 
They can reuse words. They can become kind of glue things like the and of and and. You know, you start to produce them. And is a very, you know, fantastic functional word, very appealing to computer scientists, right? I mean, our language is an algorithmic business, and and um, it might upset the poets, I guess. But anyway, it's you know, and has this very functional reason. So you don't have to have a, a special and if you're saying a pig and a banana, right? That doesn't have to. That and doesn't have to say something about pig and banana in it, right? We can generalize, or a, you know, a big thing and another big thing. They can be big as a good general word. So we'll reuse things. <coughs> in a way, it's a reflection of you know, knowledge. All right, so, uh, so, <coughs> so very simple idea. Let's convey as much information with as little cost, right? So we want to minimize the expense, you know, the, which is for us producing words and having them understood uh, as, uh, against the, uh, how much information we're conveying. Alright, so we can make our cost very, very minimal by just having one word, but that's going to be uh, low information. Right. Ook, ook, ook. Doesn't get us anywhere. <coughs> Unless you're in the disk world. Alright. <laughs> ah, good. <laughs> oh, Mandelbrot is... Um, Polish? I was going to say Polish, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's... But he's, he's uh, oh, so Mandelbrot means almond bread important fact, which he would point out quite a lot. Uh, but he may, he's, is, does he have French? I don't know. All right, you can look it up. Uh, he was a Polish-born French and American mathematician. Okay. American because he moved here. Yeah. So he worked at Yale and IBM. Yeah, there you go. He was a child his family immigrated to France. So he was, probably spoke a lot of French. Like yeah. Polish. So good with language. Um, Okay, so we're going to have two measures of information. H is typically, so we, information is this tough word. Entropy is what we're going to actually use. Information sort of connotes meaning. Unfortunately, it's what we have. Shannon's measure of information. Uh, people use it all the time, but entropy is, is the right word because it means we're not sure what that is. Entropy is a little mystifying. Uh, and so costs, some costs C. So we're going to have to make up what those things are. So we'll have to think about that. So we can... You know, we, could, we could have H minus C, we'd have to have some sort of conversion factor for whatever you know, information is measured in something, bits, and cost is measured in like breadth or something, so we'd have to have some thing, but we, could, we can create a ratio and not worry about whatever the, the factor is, right? Okay, we can minimize this as well. So, we'll, so that's the setup, um, and we have to you know, explain what these things could be. Um, so, optimization, it's happening all the time. Uh, there's randomness and exploration and oddness going on. Uh, but, <coughs> you know, big question, how, to what extent does it, does it happen in systems? To, to what extent does it help? Of course, you know, we like to optimize things, we like to streamline things, make them better, you know, factories and so on. We're, we're very clever, so we, we, that helps us a lot. Um, but creativity is kind of weird, right? So creating new things is, is not about this. Platypuses are not about optimization, but we like them. Um, <coughs> so, all right, but there's some, there's some, it's always in there, it's just a hard thing to kind of go against, say, robustness, right? Robustness, is which is going to be the next topic, is, a, is about having, say, redundancy and things that aren't, in some sense, optimal, but they're optimal in the long term, in that you don't uh, exploit it. Okay, so we're going to have a little um, framing here, the quickening. Um, <laughs> fans of Pretty bad 80s movies, might enjoy this one. There can be only one, so they will not split the infinitive, that's important. This is, um, obviously was, in, was meaningful to them. <laughs> I mean, you really want to say there can only be one. Anyway, so, uh, things that should be only one of theory and Highlander films. So, uh, I just want to point out that, uh, we, we did discuss this a little bit the other day. So there was a Highlander film, it was all done by the end, it clearly kind of wraps up, that's the end, and then somehow they have another one, seven or eight years later, and they, Reboot it, there are aliens, wha whatever. Yeah, the immortality stuff was fine. We could all believe that. Um, <coughs> anyway, completely ridiculous. I think, very good point, right? So we had a Frenchman playing a Scot. A Frenchman playing a Scot, and a Scot playing a Spain. <laughs> Who was born in Egypt <laughs> thousands of years ago. <laughs> oh, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Yeah, yeah, except. <laughs> 
except what's his name, the uh, Frenchman, didn't say a lot, which was important. Right, right. <laughs> Pretty monosyllabic, yeah, yeah. Okay, so a good action film. Uh, it does have Queen, it does have, uh, it's, it's a kind of magic, so absolutely fantastic, yeah, yeah. So Freddie Mercury action. Um, <coughs> we could play it, but um, actually, actually, I, I will, I, I guess I shouldn't. <laughs> There's a little bit of this. There's a trailer, you can watch this. I'm just gonna jump into some pieces. It's kind of great. Ah, it's going to want to have an ad, I think. This guy's basically born in the 1500s in, um, are you going to work? In uh, Scotland, goes through this madness, lives in different places of the world. There we go, Connery, great. Connor McLeod, oh. McLeod. Somehow lives in Manhattan, I think, by the end of it. As a sword, yeah. He's explaining that he's, uh, yeah, there you go. And they basically have to kill each other, and when there's one left, they get a special prize. Who is it's about to face his it's completely ridiculous. Challenge. He's the bad guy. Anyway, all right. You can watch that later on. I'm not sure if you should watch the film, but basically, yeah, <laughs> the quickening. You'll see there's, uh, I'll, I'll put links up, Colbert had some great quickening usages, uh, so when other pundits disappeared, he absorbed their uh, audiences, although he rejected Keith Oberman's. He tried to absorb it, you know, with all the lightning and stuff, and it didn't work out. Um, <coughs> so, it's an important cultural motif, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Second film is horrible. It's, it's actually one of the worst, it's thought to be one of the worst films ever, yeah. You know, in the sense that it's not one of those bad films that are fun to watch. It's just a truly, truly awful film. Yeah. All right, so Man of versus Simon. So, we, we're, uh, we're going to have... Um, Prince of the Universe, great song. So we're going to have, um, uh, I'll show you how they went back and forth. So this is well before tweeting and blog posts and things, right? So you have to write your, uh, your, your disappointment with someone else's work into a paper and publish it. So Mandelbrot's piece is published in, in 53, and let's see. So an informational theory of the statistical structure of languages. That's a good, again, title's good. He's telling us what's going on. Again, we've talked about this one. This could be about, I don't know, opossums. It's not good. Doesn't, this is not, it's very, very bad. So, we've got 53, 55, Mandelbrot is, you know, builds up into some disgust and then says, a note on a class of skew distribution functions. Analysis and critique, goes, goes ad hoc, he's gonna pull his name out. <laughs> H.A. Simon, by that guy. Simon doesn't wanna do that, comes back a year later with some further notes on a class of skew distribution functions. Just, you know, this, right? references Mandelbrot, but doesn't really have to put it in the title. Um, <coughs> so, <laughs> man, I'm not saying this is it, and I'm going to say your name again, so final note, that's it, that's it, I'm bigger than you, my brain is bigger, which maybe is true, um, <coughs> re reply to final note by Ben, <laughs> ben Wyman, well, right? opens up the box again, so now we're in the 6161, this is all 61, postscriptum, the final note, right? And then reply, and now he's going, all right, that guy, Mandelbrot's <laughs> postscriptum. And that's, that's kind of the end of it. But it's, it is, I mean, they're all, they're all papers, you know, they're not little like, go away, you know, 140 characters, they're all comments. Uh, so I, <laughs> right, yeah, it's the old, the old star. They, 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 it's sped up towards the end, much like the quickening. All right. <laughs> uh, so... Mandelbrot, so we will, we, I'm just going to say it again, right? What, uh, my objections before, and here we get this sort of business, the Pareto, Yule, Zip, a stoop, you could put all in there. Um, our objections are valid, quite irrespective of this business, so that most of Simon's reply was irrelevant. The idiot. Uh, Mandelbrot has proposed a new set of objections to my blah, blah, blah. Like his early objections, these are invalid. So it's full of this sort of stuff, right? <laughs> so you have people with giant brains. There's a little shout out to <laughs> Plankton. It's a great moment. <laughs> That's a great moment. Okay, this is an alternative framing. Two men enter, one man leave. Two men enter, one man leave. Two men enter, one man leave. Two men Two men enter, one man leave. Two men enter, one man Obviously, yeah, that went downhill as well. Um, <laughs> Mel Gibson, wow. Uh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Who, of course, had great films in the past. Gallipoli is amazing. All right. Very different tone. So let's see. Right. Let's. Uh, so so no. We, right. So they're having a fight about this, and let's see what the why Mandelbrot was so sure of himself. 
It was just Mandelbrot, I think, is the answer to that. But let's, 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 let's see. OK, so we have language. Let's work through the, the setup. Language is n. His language is going to make up a pretend language. It's got n words. And let's imagine that, you know, in general, it has some, there's some abundance of word appearance. And we'll think about it as a probability. So uh, there's, you know, th th again, there's this, this, there's this, this problem with all of these things where there's no phrase structure or correlation between words. Okay. Um, that's true of Simon's model as well. The words are just, you know, appearing in this text in a crazy way. Uh, you know, if you just randomly sort, randomly sort Moby Dick and then just try to read that, it's not going to be fun. Might be better than the original. But anyway, so <laughs> Herman. All right, so let's see. Um, obviously not true. Um, it turns out for his construction, which is interesting, words, the composition, the, the letters involved was important. So this, this is a for alphabetically based language. Um, James Glick, in his book, the Information, has a nice piece in the alphabet, claims that it was really only invented once, and, it's, and it was contagious. Great little line. Uh, the alphabet was contagious. Um, <coughs> all right, so let's say that our alphabet has M letters, and kind of an odd thing. So this, okay, all right, so there's all sorts of stuff about this. Zipf looked at this. There are papers that have appeared in the last few years that are controversial about this. Uh, about the length of words and the information content involved and so on. Uh, but he's going to just state it. So uh, the shortest words are, so, so they're going to be ordered by, by length, shortest words first. Uh, it's not going to be a very good language, so all M, all one letter words will be available in this language. That obviously doesn't happen. Uh, all two-letter words will be available. So, you know, we have on roughly 100 instead of out of 26 times 26. Um, <coughs> so that's, you know, funny feature, but fair enough. Uh, let's see. So word cost is going to be simply the length of the word, how hard it is to stay. Hmm. And, uh, of course, that was irrelevant for Simon's model, but just to, just to compare. So that's, gonna, that's where we're going to get our cost from. So the longer words are going to be more informative, is really the story, but they're going to cost more. It's, it's not unreasonable, yeah. It's not unreasonable. They're rare words, so when you see them, they really mean something. They really, they really mean something. The ones that are much more common, generally you have to have some context around them, or, or they're glue-type words. Okay. <coughs> all right. Real words don't use all letter sequences. Um, Maybe real world sort of words sort of follow this pattern, yet we can look this, we can talk about that, right? But it's, it's, it's sort of a fraction of them, for example. Some fraction of two letter words exist, and the same sort of fraction exists for three letter words. It's obviously not true. Uh, you, could, you could argue these sorts of things or, or look at them. Words may be encodable in this way, which is another funny thing to do. We can just take all the words and then map them into these uh, codes, which of course is kind of what we do with code anyway, or you can just say go away. Mandelbrot would like that. All right, so here's a simple little introduction to entropy, uh, <coughs> which some of you will have seen in lots of contexts. Again, it's, it's this tricky kind of framing of inform information suggests meaning, which, you know, if you look at Shannon's original paper, the first sentence is, this is not about meaning, people. Don't, I'm not, that's not what we're doing. Uh, but it's just, just sort of a common sense view of that word, or feeling of that word, is, is, is meaning. Anyway, so entropy is good, because it's obscure. Um, <coughs> and it, it actually really does deeply connect to statistical mechanics uh, versions of entropy. All right, so let's say, here are words. It's a horrible language. Um, it's a binary alphabet. We've got two letters and a space. So we'd order our words in this way. And this is, you can see what's going to happen if we go to M letters. So this is their rank, one, two, three, four, five. So they have lengths, one, two, two, three, three, right? So the lengths are jumping in this uh, logarithmic way. So if you look at uh, one plus log two i, then that's ru a rough, it's going to match up with uh, the lengths of words uh, on the powers of two. So this is, this is going to be something we can, this is what Mandelbrot used. You can roughly use this as an estimate of the length and therefore the cost. Right, you have to, you know, to get to this, you have to, you know, you have to, a few monks went the wrong way, and then you, you kind of come up with this. Um, I mean, it's not 
too hard a thing. So the word length, the, the, the two, 2 to the power of kth word is k plus 1, right? So 2 squared, uh, mm, mm, mm. should that be the 2 to the uh, k plus, k minus 1? Oh, it's the eighth word. That's right. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Very good. Thank you. All right. So eight. Yep. 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 <coughs> so apparently, for Scots, the eleven is a is a difficult word for people to understand. You should look that video up. Eleven minus a eight. Okay. All right. Eight. Uh, okay. So let's see. Um, uh, all right, good. So we're good. This is not a lie. Uh, that's good. So, and this is exactly 1 plus log base 2 of 2 to the k, which is a funny thing to do, right? We've got our 1s, but log base 2 of 2 to the k, we'll put our k down, log 2 of 2 is 1, right? So we can kind of make, make this happen. And this is i, right? This is the, right, 8, 8. So <laughs> we can say that approximately the word length will be 1 plus log 2i. And if we have an alphabet with M letters, we'll generalize this, it's going to be log based M of I. And so the one is just an offset. The log, we can always take a log and say, multiply it by a factor to get log base E, because we like log base E when we're going to differentiate things. There will be differentiation. All right, but that's, so this is fairly sneaky, right? We, we take the ith word, and one plus log base M of I will be an estimate of its length, which we'll take as its cost. So we have cost. So cost is growing slowly with rank. Exciting, all right. So the ith word in this big list of words is going to have this cost. Um, <coughs> plus a space, we can do that. This turns out to be, this is a very small point, but this turns out to be an important uh, aspect for his, uh, for Mandelbrot's model. And we'll actually just make it plus a at some point, see what happens there as well, because plus one is, I don't know. So this is, the, uh, this is a measure of cost then, <coughs> if we're going to add a space. We can subtract off the fixed cost. That's fine. All the words have that, so we can just take that off. That's an arbitrary piece. Uh, and then we have log base m. And you can always do this sort of thing, as I said, right? So log base m of i plus 1, or blob, log base m of blob, is log e of blob divided by log e m. And you can think about this guy, if you want for recreational pleasure, you can get this to work out in your head. Um, we won't do it just here, but that's the uh, conversion. So you can convert, you can have you know, log of x <coughs> equals log of x, you know, with whatever basis you want with the, uh, the conversion there. All right, so we're just gonna throw away that thing at the bottom and say, okay, cost is gonna be proportional to natural log of rank plus one. Okay, good, so we've messed around, now we've got a nice little thing. So total cost then, well, we had n words, they have probability i, p, p sub i, and they have this cost we've put in. So the, the cost is going to be proportional to the sum uh, of these costs weighted by their probabilities. Right? So a very low probability. So, so we expect that because this is getting bigger as it grows out, as i increases, we want the probability to go down. So that's the right kind of feeling, right? So that words that are long, that um, have more information, that are rare, if you like, or should be, should be rare, which means low probability. Okay, so he's setting up. It's a bit of a funny language, obviously, but <coughs> it's not a bad sort of pencil and paper action. Okay, so good, good, good. All right, so that's cost. So we need uh, something on the other side for information and um, entropy, right? Entropy is the business. So this, is, this funny looking thing is what we want. Uh, it's, it's the classic structure, right? So it's minus the sum of uh, the weighted average of log base two of p sub i. And what I'm gonna sort of roughly explain is that this quantity here, so this is, this is an average of something, right? Or if we put the minus sign in here, it's actually, right, so minus log two, P sub i, that's, if you put the log inside, it's this guy. All right, so we have this times this, the sum from i equals 1 to n, and this is uh, our entropy. So this is sum from i equals 1. I do like writing on boards. 
Okay, P sub i. Right, so in general, you know, whatever this blob is here, sum of i equals 1 to n of p sub i, whatever this thing is, it's, you're taking the average, right? So if this was i squared, you take, that's the second moment. If it was i, we're just calculating the mean. We're calculating the average of this thing, which has prob the probability built into it. So it's a bit of a funny piece, but you can think of it like that. So what does that represent? All right. So I, I've, as I've been saying, um, information is a bit of a funny word. Apparently von Neumann, uh, who's a pretty smart character, suggested use entropy because no one understands what that is. <laughs> That's going to help. Um, and so the idea is actually that thing over there, this log base 2 of 1 over pi is uh, an estimate of the number of bits that that word, given that it, it has a probability p sub i, that that word, uh, if optimally encoded, requires. All right, so let's kind of argue this. Right, so here it is. It's minus log 2 pi, so it's, as I said, log 2 of 1 over pi. So it's the minimum number of bits, zeros and ones, uh, needed to distinguish it from, definitely from, from uh, all others. So let's just look at a couple of these things. So if you, we have a word that appears half the time, right, it's appearing half the time, Let's put it in here. We have log 2, 1 over p sub i, so it's going to be log 2, 1 over a half, which is log 2 over of 2, which is 1. So you really just need one bit, which is to say, you know, if, if you see a 0, it's going to be this word. If you see a 1, it's one of the other words. Like you just, you need a, you just right, divide it like that. And then the others will need more division. So if, if, if it's 1 over 64, which is 2 to the 6, then we, get, we put it in here, 1 over 2 to the 6, we flip that up. So we'll get our um, 2 to the minus, well, yeah, 64 is 2 to the 6. So it's, the probability is 2 to the minus 6. So we'll end up with 6. So we'll need 6 bits to definitively separate that from all the other words. Okay? Um, so things that are rarer, very rare, then we'll use lots of bits to encode them. Okay. So, you know, this doesn't, this is all about, uh, you know, one word gets mapped to one encoding. There's nothing about, um, as I said, correlations between words. You, you, have to, you can do more complicated things. Uh, we're clever. We've figured out all sorts of ways to encode stuff. All right. Um, so we can do the same business as before with this little conversion thing. We can make it log base E if we uh, put this factor in here. So all of this collapses back to log base 2 of P sub i. And then we have this form. It's some constant, really this thing, times p sub i log pi. Right? G equals 1 over log 2. So that's not bad. It looks similar to the other one. We had um, PCI, we had log of uh, i plus 1 in here. Right? That's the only difference. So this is a p sub i sticking in here. Good. So <coughs> here's our game. Uh, we want to minimize cost divided by um, entropy. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, you can maximize the opposite, but yeah, all right, minimize that. Uh, and we must have all the probabilities add up to one, so we have a constraint. So what's this kind of thing? We have things in our pockets. We have a gamma function. We have a special little thing in our case with a gamma function. Put the gamma function out. Now. What do we use for this? What, what's the technique you use if you have something to optimize? Yeah, so Lagrange multipliers. All right, which if you haven't ever heard of them, it's fine. It's just a little bit of differentiation with some extra goodness. Um, that's, what, that's the business. All right, so the tension, the trade-off is that shorter words are cheaper, but they, they give you less information, right? So, and longer words, are, which are rarer, give you more information. So you want, there's some balance here. So you could, you could just use cheap words all the time, but you wouldn't convey enough information. You have to use these more expensive, informative ones to some extent. Excuse me. But you can, so you can see that it probably has to decay. It's not obvious that it should decay like a power law. It could be exponential. I mean, it, you know, it's going to decay, but I don't know. All right. So let's set this thing up. I'm going to put it all together. So this is a function we want to minimize, and the way we go about Lagrange multipliers, right, we actually have n variables in here. 
right? So if you like x's, this is x1, x2, x3. Um, but it's p1 up to pn, these guys, we know they have a constraint. And we're going to put the constraint here. So this is the way this works. We make a big function, which is the thing we're trying to minimize or maximize, extremize, plus a little um, lambda. We always use lambda, I guess for Lagrange, but that's our little multiplier, plus a function that contains the um, constraint. So let's show what they are. All the madness. So we have cost divided by uh, uh, information. So this is our cost madness, right? So it's uh, sort of the average of this quantity, the natural log of i plus 1. And on the bottom, we, so we do have this constant in front of it. We'll keep it there. The, min the minus sign is quite important. You can't get rid of that. Um, pi log pi, classic information structure. And we have a constraint function, which is, and, and usually the way you, you set up constraint functions is that um, you just put everything on one side and set, set it equal to zero. So this is our constraint function. It's the sum of pi minus one. That's a function by itself with the, with, with the uh, extra point that later on we will set it equal to zero, but you just leave it floating in here. All right. If you've seen them, it's probably okay. If you haven't, it's all right. Uh, we're going to do partial derivatives. So we have n partial derivatives here. And they all, there's the symmetry, so you just really do one, right? So you differentiate with respect to p sub k. And you kind of hold on, you know, grab something to bite while you do it. And then you just sort of make sure you don't make a mess. You know, sticks, sticks are always good. Um, <coughs> you, you need to have a calculating stick next to you. What's a stick for? Um, so you get to do it. Yeah. <laughs> See, that'll be fun, right? Much more, much better than being tortured by me doing it in front of you. Um, but there's a setup. Lots of monks have been um, said goodbye to, right? And you have to be the next monks, all right? Okay, so you, you grit your teeth and you'll get to this thing. You'll find that uh, the p sub j have this crazy looking thing here. So this is just some constant prefactor, which has whatever the entropy is, whatever the cost is, those things are in there. They're just some numbers at, at by the end of it. And then there's this, right? So there's j plus 1 to a power, a <laughs> negative power. And we're like, yeah, it's great, because now we have probably distribution. It's um, decaying. So this, right, so it's proportional to j plus 1 to, the, to the whatever that thing is. It's a bit funny. You think you might not be able to calculate that, but you will. Uh, I'm very excited. So we get a power law, yay. And um, <coughs> our exponent, ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this, the form of this is it's, it's in Zipf's, law, Zipf's Law's format. That's why, right, so the exponent is alpha. So Simon's model found the size frequency distribution. We got the gamma, right, the, that's associated with that. And Zipf's Law being the flip of the CCDF which we know about, that's what this structure is, because it's ranks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and probability is the size of the word. Right? It's, the, it's the abundance of the word, normalized. So that's, it's the same as finding the populations of the cities and ranking them. So it's a zip floor uh, structure, So which we, which we use this um, parameter alpha. So that's, that's what, right, that's what Mandelbrot's direct approach gets, and we can compare it to the exponent that we get out of Simon's model. All right. Now, you will do a sneaky thing using the constraint, so which is, again, that the sum of the probabilities has to equal 1. So you have to have that. Um, and some other things, you have to do some other sneaky things, so we'll help you with that. And then uh, you, you actually find out that, in fact, um, oh, yeah, this normalization cleans up that, in fact, one, this, this blob here is equal to uh, minus one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is in fact completely, this is the end result. So this is, it's equal to this. That's, that's a few monks went west in that, in that approach. Yeah. Unsuccessfully went west. And then, so now we actually have it. This probably is equal to this, right? And we assume n is large, so we can normalize this thing. And that's how we'll get, get the exponent. All right. So the, here's our constraint. This is where we really use the constraint. So we have uh, the sum from 
j equals 1 to n of our probability, whatever you, you know, you're going to find this form, put this guy in, it's the sum from whatever this exponent is, the sum from j equals 1 uh, to j plus 1 to the minus alpha, that has to equal 1. So as n becomes very large, it's a bit tricky, but as n becomes very large, we can, uh, we can just say, you know, this goes to infinity, and then this is a very famous uh, mathematical beast, which continues to give pure mathematicians something to have nightmares about, and feel really happy about. I don't know. They're strange people. Okay, so let's see. So if it's, yeah, so uh, <coughs> we love them. So, so let's say if we just had 1 over uh, k, I'll just use a different thing, 1 over k to the alpha, this is the sum from k equals 1 to infinity, that's the zeta function of um, alpha. <coughs> Nasty little beast. So when k equals 1, it blows up, right? It's just on that logarithmic edge. 1, one plus a half plus a third, famously, it's pop. Uh, but as alpha is greater than 1, it's all right. It, it, it uh, <coughs> behaves well. And then there are strange things. If alpha is a uh, complex number, you can do that, because we're mathematicians, we'll do that. Uh, and the, the uh, zeros of this thing are on the real part of alpha equals a half line at the primes. So it's, a, it's this fantastic mathematical object. For some reason, the primes are in this thing. So it has the mysteries of the universe buried inside it. Anyway, so we'll, maybe we'll, we'll figure that out. Anyway, so great game. But it, anyway, it's well known. And there we know some of the values well. Uh, right? You can figure these guys out. Um, <coughs> And we're starting not quite, it's not quite that format because we're starting at 2, right? J equals 1, we start at 2. Right? So it's 2 minus alpha, 3 minus alpha, 4 minus alpha. So we're missing that first guy. So in fact, we have 1 equals, um, it's going to be the zeta function of uh, alpha minus 1. Right? This, is, this bit is the 1 to the minus alpha uh, entry, if you like. That should be a zeta function. <coughs> you can think about this. Okay, so we end up with, so we, we end up, so if we, we have a minus one, put this guy on the other side, we get two. So the zeta function of uh, that blob, h over gc equals two. Uh, this is our, our exponent. So you can solve for that. So that's something to just solve for, right? This is a bit of a funny thing to do, but you can just you can find the value of um, the, the the argument of the zeta function that, that gets sent to two. Um, <coughs> and you'll find, so you can find this, alpha <laughs> is about 1.73. So that's a that is a bit of a problem here because alpha should be less than one or less. The way the zip business works is it should be one or less, right? So we, we generally see, well, it doesn't have to be, but generally we see that, and we see um, at the same time, size frequency distribution will be two or steeper. Those things map to each other. So what was it? Alpha equals uh, one plus one over gamma minus one. Right, so, nope, that's not right. Uh, What have I got wrong? Is it just, wh which one is it? It's just this? Yeah, right? Yeah. The other way around is the other, right. <sighs> Thank you. <coughs> right, so uh, yeah, so gamma equals two, we get one. Yeah, okay. Uh, and 1.73 is a little, it's a little funny. That's a, that's a, a gamma less than one, which is not what we see for Zipf's law. Anyway, he just doesn't quite mention that at the end of the, uh, the business. Here's what uh, Mandelbrot did was, was just mess around a little bit. So you can, we'll, we'll have this as a, uh, something to, to do. So instead of having j plus 1 all along, right? So all along we've had this j plus 1 in the cost function. We could make it j plus a because what's a space might cost something slightly different. Uh, so you'll see, you can see that as you increase a, you'll decrease alpha. So we want to see, you know, what value of a gives you alpha equals 1. So alpha equals 1 would be kind of a, a decent 
outcome, right? That's, you know, whether it is exactly that or not for Zipf's law, it's certainly roughly there, so we want to see if this produces that. You know, and it is, as we said, pure optimization story. You know, maybe there are issues with what was chosen exactly for H and C. It could be improved in certain ways. It could be also that, you know, Simon's model is the right kind of, roughly the kind of right story, it's a growth story, but you get this for free. You get some kind of optimization for free, which is strange. So we'll see if that's true. All right, that's our postcard for this one. Um, I mean, it's a very reasonable argument, and as you saw, it led to lots of arguments. Uh, <coughs> so you'll figure these things out, but clearly these guys couldn't figure out each other's work. You will figure out their work, but they weren't happy with what each other had done. Why are we doing it? Um, yeah, so you could, you could structure the thing that you're trying to optimize in different ways. You could do, I mean, I'm not sure if this would work. You, you could try something like cost minus something times entropy, or you know, entropy minus something times cost. So there's some balance of those things. But because they're, in principle, sort of incommensurate, right? A ratio is a better thing to do. So if you're trying to optimize something that's measured in qubits and something that's measured in mass, then you, you might have a, you know, you, of course we have a, you know, we could just put a prefactor that changes them, changes the units, but uh, you could also work on the ratio. So, yeah, I mean, it could be something that gets changed if you minimize, you minimize some variation of this. But you, it should be the case that you can think about this. I mean, if you did, cost squared divided by entropy, right? For some reason, you think that's okay. Uh, so you, you could mess around in some, some ways that might give you something else. I have to think about that. But at base, what it says is, if you increase, you're trying to minimize this thing, right? So cost is on top. If it goes up, that's bad. You want it to go down. At the same time, you want entropy to go up. Okay, yeah, so the tension is, yeah, you want to minimize cost because it's on top. That will help. Uh, but there's also, you know, if you, if you increase the cost by 10% and decrease the entropy by, you know, if you do something like this, then that balances out. Like, that's not a good trade-off. Well, it's not enough of a trade-off to, to move to that point. You also hope that there is actually a, you know, a minimum. Um, that it's not the case that you go to zero entropy, you know, zero information and, Something like something, you know, something strange like that, or infinite information, some, something odd. You know, you don't want it to be an. Odd, you want something to be in between, which we've sort of, as we've argued through this, you could see there's a tension that sh you know should give you this minimum in the in the middle of extremes, right? Because if you just minimize costs, you just you know you don't say anything. If you maximize information, then you just got all these long specific words. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, so, all told, uh, certainly optimization is something we see everywhere, so it's not a bad um, uh, thesis to have. Um, <coughs> lots of different things can go into optimization, which makes it tricky, right? So it could be something where we have a real monetary cost that everyone believes in. Robustness, as I said, is a big deal, right? It's just that that might be hard to measure, but it's just you don't want the thing to explode. How people feel about the system. If we've got people, or platypuses, you know, how they feel about it, octopuses. Um, so I think in the end, you, we, we kind of have to say that, that the argument is, uh, you know, a reasonable one, but it doesn't quite, it doesn't quite have the, uh, the micro story is a bit hard to deal with, right? So there's this J plus one and that log for the, for the cost, and, and maybe that's the thing that needs to be improved. You know, what's the real cost? A information, we're quite happy with that. Entropy, that's a, you know, this very famous w principled measure of, of the, um, um, well, of information. So, uh, but maybe it's the cost that needs to be tweaked. And in Simon's model, of course, you have this very nice story. You have an a innovation rate, which has this kind of, you can, you can feel good about that, and it connects directly into the exponent. Um, so, as I'm saying here, yeah, the, the exponent, it, it depends on that J plus A piece a little too much, and we're not really sure what that is. Like, it's hard to, hard to see how to measure that. 
you can certainly measure the rate of innovation of something. All right. This is, so actually, from the, from the book, I want to point out a few things. So it's a good calculation to go through. Uh, it's interesting, there's actually some back and forth at the end of his paper. Right? Sometimes this happens. So, um, <laughs> someone with three names. So, Mandelbrot says that the actual direction of evolution is, in fact, towards fuller and fuller utilization of places. We are, in fact, completely without evidence as the, ev the existence of any direction of evolution in language is axiomatic, which is pretty strong here, that we shall remain so. So many people de <coughs> deny the direction of evolution could be theoretically possible. See, interesting, theoretically possible is, says that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to look at reality, I'm just going to say what my people think. Thus I myself take the view that a language develops in what is essentially a purely random manner. I mean, this is an amazing statement, I think. Mandelbrot, who, as I said, could really, you know, go at people. Uh, as to the units being possible differences between pairs of utterances is a logical consequence of the fact that two, two is the, <laughs> the least integer greater than one. So he's got some stuff in there. But um, <coughs> anyway, I, th I just remember reading this and thinking, wow, that's kind of weird. Um, so I do have a little piece that I might show, which has got some results for, for language, you know, because language and communication is incredibly interesting. But you can see really clear evolution, for, in, for instance, in English, in the disappearance of, um, or the regularization of irregular verbs, right? This, they have been, they have half-lives, it appears. And to be and to have, have, you know, by these kind of, you could project it out, they have half-lives of sort of 40,000 years before we say, I am, you am, we am, he am. Um, you know, new verbs are always, right? I Google, he Googles, she Googles. They're all regular in, in structure. But there are about 150 irregular verbs in, in English. Anyway, so there are these, you know, these patterns. Of course, we've got the zip thing, um, which people, as I'll, I'll show you some more about this, people argue about whether that means anything. Uh, okay, so there have been efforts over the years to, and they're still going, it's absolutely still going on, where people have mixed up optimization, randomness. Uh, we'll get to this one in our next section on robustness, hot theory, highly optimized tolerance, very good, which will also be to do with forests. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Ikancho and Solo's piece in 2002, so um, talking about the principle of least effort again. They're trying to deal with it. Uh, Raisa D'Souza had a paper in uh, PNAS with she and some colleagues. Again, this kind of, uh, it was a mixed story, optimization and, and randomness, something to do with scale-free networks. So, you know, this is, this is 2007, this is all very recent. Um, this just goes on and on. So, um, there is a whole, s whole little sort of uh, er area where people say, oh, you know, monkeys could do this, right? It's the whole random typing thing, which is a little rude with the, the monkeys. <coughs> Dignified characters. All right, but there, you know, the idea if you just randomly type out, you eventually you'll produce Shakespeare's work somewhere, and you'll produce every version of Shakespeare's work with one, you know, error in it and so on. They'll just be there in this whole mess. Um, you know, it's a sort of silliness that you get with saying, well, pi has every possible, you know, thing in it. It's, it's sort of because of its randomness and it's got every possible, so it's got your DNA in there somewhere. Um, but it's unfindable, right? It's meaningless. So, Miller was a colleague of, uh, of Zipf, and so, as I said, Zipf passed away in 49, and there was a reprint of his book where Miller just said, you know, I'm going to write the introduction, I'm going to just, you know. I didn't like this stuff. Um, so, it's in here, I don't know if I should pull this out. So, I think, so Miller has a number of things he was <coughs> famous for. One is that we can only remember seven digits. Was, was, you may have heard that one, that's, a, that's his. Uh, can I get this to work? Yeah, he has this, uh, let me get this, come on, come on, Adobe, terrible thing, that's not working out. Yeah, so he starts off with saying, uh, it's not going to please everyone, Ziff was the kind of man who would take apart roses to, to count their petals. <laughs> If it violates, you know, obviously that's helped us with medicine, for example, by the way. Um, if it violates your sense of values to tabulate different words in a Shakespearean sonnet, this is not a book for you. So this turns out to be, you know, the, the whole, like, breaking up into words and counting things, it did get a bit of a bad rap for itself because people used it to, share, you know, say that this, this work wasn't written by Shakespeare, it was written by, you know, whoever. Um, 
and then people, you know, that, that didn't work out. There's all sorts of, so, so people sort of shied away from it. But now we have this framing of the digital humanities, and, and so people are kind of coming back into it. You know, some people measure the happiness of books, for example. All right. So uh, leave your language alone and avoid King George Kingsley's if like the plague. This is the introduction. He's like, don't read this, it's terrible. You know, you'll be much happier reading Mark Twain, you know, da da da, you know, like, go, or try, try Auden. Um, for that, you know, all right. <laughs> However, for those of us who do not flinch to see beauty murdered in a good cause, Ziff's scientific exertions yielded some wonderfully unexpected results to boggle the mind. So he's giving him something. But then he comes back and says, you know, by the way, monkeys could do this. And it's just not, it's not interesting. There's no real mechanism for this. And he has a paper that which, 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 you know, it's got monkeys in the title. Um, it's, uh, ooh, nice. Zipf, of course, has become, I mean, Zipf, Zipf's law is, you know, talked about all the time. Um, Well, he's got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's saying, "Well, people thought it was interesting, blah, blah, blah," and then he says, "Yeah, yeah, here it is." So Zip was wrong. His facts were right enough, but not his explanations. In a broader sense, he was right. However, you know, and he, he called to attention that you could look at these statistical things. Basically, he just says it's not interesting because it comes from randomness. Anyway, so as I've said, this this has been sort of fought against over you know, what is it now, sixty years, right? Sixty-five years. Uh, and, and some people will think this is just it. Let me get this back to here. Okay. Um, it's my little thing of me, thing of me. Oh, it's in my hand. Okay. <laughs> that happens with unfortunate frequency. Okay, so <laughs> like where are my glasses? On me. Okay, so you people don't do that. You're young. Oh, so let's see. So, uh, so you know, Miller mentions genes of language in here in this introduction which is <coughs> interesting because it's what Dawkins would later on call memes and then sort of shy away from and, and it, you know, memes is sort of this, people use it all the time, you know, memes spreading and so on, but it's not, a, it's not really a solid science for it. I mean, it's very appealing, but there isn't a right thing. Um, there you go, so this is 2010. Random text did not exhibit the real Zipf's law like rank distribution. So this is saying, Miller, you're an idiot, and this is 2010. Ah, unbelievable. All right, okay, uh, I, think, I think I'll skip through this. Yeah, saying that people know about these things. All right, so uh, who wins? Well, I don't know. So there's a, this is a paper from 2008, uh, actually when I was teaching at the Santa Fe Institute, teaching at Force on Networks, the lead author here uh, pointed out his work to me, it's very nice, and so, you know, but it's not the only one. Uh, this, uh, I showed you this at the start, this is for, uh, uh, Debian, <sighs> I, I used to use Red Hat sla and Slackware, yeah. All right, <coughs> it was a time where if you installed it on, this is 1995, if you installed Linux, you had the, there was a real threat that you could destroy the, the, the screen on the laptop <laughs> with the wrong X uh, F86 config. Anyway, all right, it's all much easier now, especially if your Linux box is an Apple. Um, Okay, so power laws here. This is for the number of links coming into um, uh, packages, right? Packages point to other packages, which ones they depend upon. There's some evolution, and I think it is, it must be in this way, right? So this is, it's growing, because it's not normalized, right? This is not probably a distribution. Uh, this is the number of, there are more packages. So there's an evolution. You can see that it's, you know, it's keeping this mu equals one business. Uh, this is an effort to get at when these packages come in. So they have so many, they have uh, a certain number of links already. What's the change in links as you move? So it's not, see, so they don't have a gradual thing. You don't have, oh, we've got a new link into this package from this package. So we don't have that granularity. We have, here is a system at one point, and here is it, you know, six months later or a year later or whenever it was. So you have all of these new links have been added. So you have to kind of, Look at that. Um, so, roughly, the more li so there's a rich gets richer story. A lot of scatter here for sure, but th that's what they're pulling out, and it's roughly linear. Is is the observation? This is a kind of thing you can do in lots of other things, with, especially with growing networks. Uh, so there have been other works. So that that would suggest a kind of Simon-like story, this kind of growth thing. So there's no growth, of course, in Mandelbrot's story. It's okay, but it was just sort of, it's a mature thing and it just has a state. 
Uh, this is a paper, this is back in 2001, and this is the Alta Vista data. Uh, showed that Simon's model actually worked quite well for, for, that, for that story. Uh, so again, we have a probably the new flavor appears. Um, and you, this is for a six month period in, in like a thousand years ago. Uh, row is 0.1, right? That's probably of a, a new page appearing. People are putting up their funny little pages in web 1.0. Um, <coughs> and that if you use Simon's uh, estimate, right? So gamma is one plus one over one minus row. I guess that's what I was doing before. Uh, so that's about 2.1. And that matches up well with uh, the, the measurement they had for the actual distribution for the number of links into pages. So, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing you want, right, in general. Right? The, this, this row is a, is, is a measure of the micro growth story. This is a big picture description in the exponent. All right, so it's a good place to stop. So we're gonna have, so the Simon-like models are pretty good. They're not everything, and, and we'll come to complex networks later on. We'll see it is absolutely a gigantic part of that story. Uh, and I've talked to you about the solar price and Barabasi and Albert, but we'll go right into it. It's a different kind of uh, computation. Uh, it may be that for free, you kind of get this optimality. And um, that would be rather remarkable, but it, 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 it may actually be the case. And I think that's, uh, that's where we want to finish. I'm going to show you this before you go, just clean your brains out. So a robin fell out of a tree, and it was a very tall tree, and we couldn't get it back. And this little crazy thing spent, we, we had it inside for a, during the night, and then we'd take it outside. We have lots of videos of this little character, but it was very friendly, and uh, eventually, and its parents would feed it all day. So robins are really, I didn't know this about robins, so their parents feed them for four months, long time. And they're hopeless, you know, they're just like they're like they they chirp and they sit there and it was just a champ. So we'd sit in the backyard, we sat in the backyard for weeks making sure this thing didn't get, really? get eaten by cats. Um, and eventually it got big enough to fly away. Oh. That's pretty good. There you go. But yeah. <laughs> Random piece of information. That's just so you can feel good. Nothing happened here today. There was a little birdie. All right, thank you.